Grace to you and peace and welcome again to this service of Palm Sunday. It's so good to be gathered together today. Uh, what a blessing the junior choir uh, is to us. Uh, that wonderful anthem that they've uh, uh, that they offered for us, and of course uh, Mary and Harrison for their leadership, and for William Schaefer and the trumpet today as well, uh, coming together to bless us uh, with those uh, with that beautiful sound and that joyful noise. Uh, as our exploration of the gifts of the dark wood begins, begins to come to a close, we look around us to acknowledge the kingdom, the family that is always and is already right here with us. Sojourners in the dark wood do not go it alone. 
but are blessed with the presence of others to help us see, reflect with us, and discover together with us the riches of a life lived with intention. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem at the beginning of that fateful week, he is surrounded by those who will live the uncertainty, temptation, and emptiness right alongside him. Unexpected love. Enter our lives and open us to the gifts residing deep within the holy darkness of our lives. Open us to seek your voice from deep within, for we yearn to feel you moving in us. In your many names we pray. Amen. writers tell us the story of Jesus's final days and how he began that last week by entering in to Jerusalem in a great procession. Today we read St. Luke's account of that triumphant entry. Uh, Charity will read those words, that passage for us now. Good morning, Charity. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, this is 29 through 42a. When he had come near Bethage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden, and tie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A second reading of scripture comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 25 through 31. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Spirit of the We center our hearts and our minds on God's word. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, let your spirit fall upon us and bless this moment of preaching that your word may be proclaimed and received anew into the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who do you think took the colt back to its owner after Jesus rode it into Jerusalem? Maybe it's because the pandemic makes planning anything more difficult and requires more detailed step-by-step -step thinking to complete formerly simple tasks. But the first thing I thought of this week when I read the familiar Palm Sunday passage from St. Luke's Gospel was a question I'd never thought of before. What happened to the animal that Jesus rode into town? His disciples borrowed it, so one of them must have taken it back. And I wonder what that exchange with the owner was like. Thanks for letting us borrow the colt, they must have said. Oh, you're welcome. So how did that whole thing go? Oh, it was great, wonderful turnout. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I heard the cheers of the people. Oh yeah, as we were coming into town, the people started throwing their cloaks and palm branches in the way. Oh. That sounds incredible. Well, well, then what happened? Well, so they're waving the branches and the crowd starts chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's this whole scene playing out. That's amazing, incredible. Well, then what happened? 
Well, some Pharisees were yelling at Jesus, telling him to shut everybody up and send everybody home. And he was all like, not a chance. I'm not going to send anybody home. Oh, amazing. All right. Well, well, then what happened? Well, then Jesus started crying. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He started talking about how messed up things were in the city. And, and then he started crying. Okay. And then what happened? Well, then he went to the temple. Yeah, well, what did he do in the temple? Well, he walked around for a little bit, looked around, and, and then he went home to spend the night at Lazarus's house. I wonder if the scene played out something like that. I imagine that a conversation like that could have taken place on the Sunday evening so long ago. I imagine that it's, because, it's possible because I'm convinced that even those who lived through the events with Jesus, especially those who lived through those events with Jesus, felt in real time the tension between their hopes and expectations and the excitement of the moment and the way things unfolded in that tragic, uncertain, sad way. If Jesus really intended to do something about liberating the people from Rome's grip on their lives, wouldn't it make sense for him to build on the momentum of his grand entrance into Jerusalem rather than sending everybody home for the night? And if Jesus was really a king, wouldn't he need to do something about the people who currently claim to be in charge of the land? And what would that something be if it didn't involve an army, if it didn't involve a fight? Author Jonathan Merritt describes the tension between Holy Week's high hopes and the frustrating way the storyline developed. In the Palm Sunday story, we have a picture of what happens to a group of very religious people when they feel disappointed by God. At the start, the crowds embrace Jesus with dopamine levels soaring and shouts of save us now. And as soon as Jesus turns out to be something other than the Savior they expect, their hosannas morph into crucify him. On the other side of resurrection, St. Paul still had this tension in mind when he wrote a word to the church in Corinth. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The thought of the cross as foolishness helps to bring into focus the next gift in our series, Gifts of the Dark Wood. For today, we take up the gift of misfits. Jesus's ministry among society's misfits, among the outcast and the marginalized and his often ignored neighbors, is an essential theme of the Gospels. Pastor Daniel Erlander elaborates on this point quite beautifully when he writes, through Jesus's ministry, lepers, prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, poor people, discarded ones, blind people, debtors, outcasts, children, women, men, elderly people, sick people, Gentiles, Samaritans, Jews, demon-possessed people, outsiders, heretics, Pharisees, lawyers, and even rich people and big deals were invited, included, affirmed loved, touched, liberated, held, embraced, healed, cleansed, given dignity, fed, forgiven, made whole, called, reborn, given hope, received, honored, freed. Jesus loved misfits and they loved him for it. But the story of Holy Week reveals something else. The Palm Sunday parade, his last supper with his disciples, betrayal in the garden, and his death on a cross, the movement from adulation to rejection and isolation, 
show us that Jesus didn't just love misfits, Jesus was a misfit too. This is the foolishness about which St. Paul wrote. It's this crazy idea that God's perfect love, perfect power, came into this world and chose the path of self-sacrifice rather than self-aggrandizement, chose the path of humility rather than riches. It's this crazy idea that God's perfect love came into this world and we made love walk through the lonesome valley, rejected and killed love because love tried to heal us of the hatreds within our own hearts. Jesus didn't just love misfits. Jesus was a misfit too. Jesus is the misfit Messiah. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Throughout Lent, We've centered our worship services around this idea that there are blessings in our lives that we see best when we're standing in the shadowed, mysterious, challenging circumstances of life. These are what we have called the gifts of the dark wood. At the beginning of the series, in the first in the first Sunday after Ash Wednesday, we confessed that life is messy and uncertain. And in the midst of the pandemic, that's not a very difficult confession to make. But today, as this series begins its resolution, we must acknowledge that our guiding light in the dark wood has been a truth that's always been with us. It was true before the pandemic changed so much, and it will still be true long after we've discovered whatever the new normal will be. It's the truth that we are all misfits, just like Jesus. Messes and uncertainties, screw ups and missteps, these aren't things about ourselves that we have to go deal with on our own before we can come back and find our place at Christ's table. The messes and uncertainties and screw-ups and missteps of our lives are the precise things that help us understand how beautiful and amazing the grace of God is that welcomes each and every one of us to the table just as we are. A final word from the Gifts of the Dark Wood by Eric Elness is on point today. Embracing our propensity for failure might seem negative to someone unfamiliar with the dark wood. Yet now you have probably begun to sense that the experiences you try so hard to avoid hold the potential to bless you with unexpected gifts if you allow them. When you embrace time spent in the dark wood, rather than seeking to run away at the first opportunity, you discover that you are connected to a higher power, one who offers important clues about who you are and what you're here for. All these gifts of the dark wood have a purpose. They lead us to the place where we can freely admit and even give thanks that the church is a group of misfits gathered around our misfit savior. Again, St. Paul helps us understand. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. Thank God for such foolishness. Our journey through Lent begins its final leg as we consider the gift of misfits. Thanks be to God for this gift. Amen. 
during Lent, we have taken time to reflect accompanied by music at this moment in worship. Following the service, you might like to take the time to write a thank you note to someone special who has been a part of your misfit community, someone who has been with you at times in the dark wood journey of your life. In this moment, however, we acknowledge one another as pilgrims and fellow travelers on this path, a church separated by the space that this pandemic demands, but united in the one whose love makes all things new. To lead us into this <clears throat> time of meditation and consideration and peace, uh, Barbara Gibson is going to read for us uh, our centering words now. Good morning. I'm reading a passage from Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, a novel from, uh, by Wolfgang, so, sorry, by Johann Wolfgang from Goethe. The world is so empty if one thinks only of mountains, rivers, and cities, but to know someone who thinks and feels with us and who, though distant, is close to us in spirit, this makes the earth for us an inhabited garden. Oh, the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. So let's continue now in a spirit of prayer. continue to be mindful of communities around our country and around the world, uh, rocked by so much from the pandemic, to gun violence, to racism, to hatred, to the ways that we um, 
lash out at one another, uh, exacerbated at times through the, uh, the restrictions and the isolation that we've experienced for so long. For those who are struggling with acute mental crisis uh, during this time, we pray. We even pray for the boat stuck in the Suez Canal as that affects so much of global commerce, reminds us that, um, that an accident in a far off land can impact all of us uh, in, um, in real ways. Uh, so for all these uh, uh, things that are on our hearts and our minds today, we pray. And I ask you now to join with me now in our intercessions for this Palm Sunday. Let's be in prayer together now. We pray to you, Lord of palm branches and the cross, for you understand us and in love, you have promised not to push away any who come to you. So we pray for people who feel pushed away, pushed away from a living faith in Jesus by pressure from friends and family those who feel pushed away by other people in churches if they do not share the same kinds of ideas or ways or clothes, for people who are pushed out by those who want power and to have control. We pray for your church, that all those who trust in Jesus will be made able by your spirit to follow his humility, to see and imitate his servant life, to welcome and not to condemn. Help your church to be like Jesus. We pray to you, Lord of palm branches and the cross, for you know the warm glow of being praised and the loneliness of being hated. In days when food banks are required in our land to feed families who struggle to provide the basics for life, we ask that you will rearrange our priorities and help us to live more like Jesus. We pray to you, Lord of palm branches and the cross, for those who have recently lost those whom they have loved. In the shock, confusion, pain, and sorrow, especially of unexpected loss, we pray for hearts to be open to the comfort of your spirit shown through friendship and community, and as deep calls to deep, we ask God of grace for the faith to follow Jesus and to give him our praise in the way we live, that we will turn away from wrong and evil and stand on the master's side, that we will be faithful in worshiping the one who has come in the Lord's name. Amen. And now let us continue to pray as children of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And now we come to that time we set aside each week to remember and to give thanks for all of the blessings that God has poured out upon us. We've taken time already today to remember the blessing of one another, of fellow travelers, of fellow pilgrims on this journey through Lent and through life. We're reminded too of the work of the East Chester Community Action Program. And as I mentioned, you can find uh, on our online giving page how to uh, make a, a direct admission gift to that important work. That as we move deeper now into a spirit of prayer, as we move deeper into this time of worship, uh, you find the opportunity to give. Nathan has shared the link uh, in the chat section, and we receive as our offering today an anthem for this week, the Holy City, 
uh, an offering offered up by Eric Nielsen for us. Let's continue now in a spirit of worship as we receive these gifts. The Holy City by Stephen Adams. Last night I lay a sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing. And I thought my dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed with glad hosannas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, the morn was cold and chill. As the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill, as the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hark how the angels sing. Once again the scene was changed, new earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea. The light of God was on his street, the gates were open wide, and all who would might enter and no one was denied. No need of moon or stars that night, nor sun to shine by day. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for the night Oh. 
Hosanna, Before we receive the invitation to enter into Holy Week and a deeper descent into the dark wood, we first uh, uh, say thank you to everyone who uh, gave of themselves uh, for this service. Those you have seen on camera and Eric, we thank you for that beautiful offertory for Mary and Harrison, for the children and the junior choir, uh, for the soloists involved in the other uh, music, for Nathan's work as well. Uh, Maria He, uh, who designed the altarpiece that you've featured, and uh, you see parts of that altar uh, piece featured behind, uh, behind me today in our uh, Palm Sunday Zoom chapel. But now I invite you to receive this invitation. Fellow travelers, we have come through the six weeks of Lent, recognizing the gifts that come to us anytime we find ourselves in the dark woods. Uncertainty can help us let go of our fear of the unknown. Emptiness can leave room for new possibilities. Thunderstruck moments can offer insight. Getting lost invites us to heighten our awareness. Temptation can help us to know our true path. And reaching out to other misfits on the journey enriches our experience of life and love. Today, we begin a deeper descent into the woods as we move into the holiest of times of remembering how Jesus himself walked the way of frustration, anger, despair, betrayal, all because of his passion for the liberation of all people. This lonesome valley, he had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. We must walk this lonesome valley. We have to walk it by ourselves. Oh, nobody else can walk it for us. We have to walk it by ourselves. The last gift of the dark wood is the gift of disappearing. This gift comes when we disappear for a while into a thin place where the human and the divine seem particularly close. That indeed is the experience of Holy Week. Let this moment carry us into the time between a liminal space where all is possible through the presence of God. Amen. <laughs> 